I'm glad uh, that we are focusing on uh, what really is important. Um, we're talking about women and national performance generally, not necessarily just politics. Um, our country suboptimizes in many ways. This is why the potential that we have, the dream of the founding fathers, have been significantly. I'm just thinking. And now in the UK Parliament, but half of them have Nigerian parents. Almost all of them are women, I believe. Well, in fact, all of them are women. Shows how Nigeria has very few women in its parliament. Rwanda does so much better than Nigeria in that regard. I mean, I travel around quite a bit, serve on a number of committees at the continental level. And whenever I sit on these panels, the woman sitting by me is a minister from Rwanda. It's one young one who is minister for um, trade and investments or something like that. And each time I talk to her, she's a nice, smart woman. But, but I think I can find 500 like her that I know in Nigeria. So why are we not fielding those ones? Our country definitely is hurting itself by not providing opportunity to these women who can take us to higher levels. I want to find out why and what we must do to change this. I mean, we thought through these uh, in the writing up of the manifesto of the Obidati uh, thrust. However, I want to operationalize these manifestos. This is why we're having this telethon, to bring people of ideas, to look at what we have proposed, and say to us, these are better ways of implementing so that we can deepen and ensure that our country gets the benefit that it deserves so it can be lifted up from where it is. Uh, I got Barista Boma Alabi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and the one and only Owa Osa Obo, a very, very distinguished management consultant and investment. Is it Guguru they call them these days or Guru? <laughs> I don't know which one it is. <laughs> but, Baba, what should we be doing? I mean, you were an outstanding, sorry, I'm saying that, you were an outstanding attorney in the UK before you returned to Nigeria. And you've done a remarkable job of work since you returned. Um, why is it that the path is more open for women, Nigerian women who live in this country, unfortunately, uh, than there is for them in our country? And what should we be doing about it? Well, um, thank you, first of all, for inviting me here. I think it's so important that we have a level playing field. The way our society works makes it very difficult for women to participate because they're patriarchal, it's a patriarchal society. Women are expected to be the caregivers at home, not just to their immediate family, but also to the extended family. Uh, a woman who's out and about at a certain hour of the day or night is viewed with some sort of moral uh, judgment. Why are you out at this time? Why are you not in your husband's house? These are some of the societal uh, norms and uh, behavior that keep women back. There are very few women who are willing to go against that trend and be labeled regardless. Those, the few of us who do that will rise to the top of wherever we happen to be involved in because you don't give a toss about what anybody says or thinks. But you shouldn't have to be in that position where you have to think, regardless of what they say, I know who I am, and I'm going to have to do what I have to do. That's why I said at the very start, we need a level playing field. When men are out there working and networking and doing what they have to do 
in order to get to the top of their game, whatever game that is, they're not judged mm. in the way women are. Mm. So that's a starting point. What about being a diaper and really um, annoying, quite frankly? It's when you go to graduations in Nigeria. They begin first class, they'll go through the list of first class, and they're all probably all women. And they start with. Uh, then we go to um, um, the we go through second class offers. Maybe halfway through going through second class offer admission, uh, uh, graduates they mention one young man, and he hope is a rock <laughs> family man. <laughs> you know, and then five years later, can find those young women, and these also ran boys in. Two to third class as senior managers, uh, this and this and this. What are the things we need to do to change that kind of trajectory? What? You know, Prof, what you just, the analogy you gave, if you had asked me a question that was generic, that's what, where I was going to start from. The mm. fact that, um, I mean, data has shown that girls do so well in school, then something happens you know, five, six years after graduation, they just vanish off the radar, you know. And um, in some ways, they actually vanish figuratively as well. Mm. And I think it ties to what Boma was talking about. Because when you don't find a place for yourself, when society has molded you to think about your role as a support and not as a primary asset um, or resource for society, you do lose something. You do lose something. And I do think that to turn the, you know, to reverse, you know, this trend that we see, a lot has to come from the woman, the female. I think increasingly we are beginning to see female role models having a voice, making a difference. Um, fathers today treat their daughters different than fathers in the past treated their daughters. Um, they, they, they are more keen to empower and build a certain degree of confidence in, in their daughters that even their wives may not have had. So, so in many ways, I do see a future that, that will be brighter. But I think that biologically, emotionally, there are various reasons why it may be easier for a woman to default to the home giver, caregiver role. Uh, because by nature we are nurturing and you know if by nature you are nurturing the tendency is that when there's a need when your when your child or daughter uh, your son or daughter has a need when your husband has a need you tend to be the one who tries to compensate and give uh, where the man is more you know oriented towards um, his career um, so I do think that over and above the kinds of empowerment and the kind of role models society is beginning to produce, a lot will have to do with the female herself. Um, and I think more um, orientation, more encouragement for females to take their destiny into their hands um, and to be that thing they envisioned themselves to be, you know, when they were making the first classes mm -hmm. and the second class offers. I think those are the kinds of things that will make women come out of what I think is still some, you know, sort of shell, whether it's self-imposed or societally mm -hmm. imposed. If I may add to that, yeah. because beyond what a woman can do, we talked about the society and where it places us, which is part of why we're in this shell. We should ensure that in every organization, no matter how small, there should be a diversity and equality policy. And that should then be implemented. Yeah, but why would, I mean, I could give a personal example. I have a daughter who's graduating in a few weeks from my Ivy League University. Why would I, after investing that kind of money, not want her to get the best the world can offer. Why would Nigerian uh, uh, parents, and it's changing like who I said, uh, why would fathers not feel it a uh, duty to ensure that the best opportunity comes to them? And I have Ndi, Ndi Kato is, um, I think online, is she there? Ndi, Ndi are you there? 
Now, okay, please. Wait on this conversation. You are younger than these two ladies sitting here uh, with me. What's your experience of this phenomenon and what do you think we should be doing? Well, I mean, younger and privileged to be on the same panel with them, please, need I add. I'm really, really proud to see women like this. Um, I'm pretty sure that they have faced, you know, a tougher battle. And, you know, at 33, I would say, they would look at me and say, my, my daughter, you're just starting. I know that's what they'll refer to me as because I've, I've not, I've, I've seen things, but I don't think I've seen on the level they have seen. But, you know, this thing is, you know, you, you were talking about seeing those young women who did the first class or, or had, you know, two one, and then where are they now? And I remember talking about in my career how I have to put in 10 times the effort for half the recognition or even less than half. And it's really that difficult. I've been in politics. I'm now 33. You know, um, this year will make it 10 years that I've been in the political space. I have served very well in the political space, you know. And what I would still notice, I remember in, 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 in the past uh, party I was in before we came to Labour Party because of our support for Peter Obi, what had happened was I remember sharing the stage with the Ghanaian president once. And, you know, I'd just spoken at this event and the Ghanaian president was there, Yakubu Gawan and all of these people. And... You know, there was all talks of how well I did and, oh, who is this young girl? And later in that evening, I had a meeting with the publicity secretary of the party and other young men. And he was talking about the new faces of the party. And then he, he makes reference. You know, he tells the young men there that, oh, you know, all of us here are here to represent the party because these are the bright new faces and all of that. And then he tells them, you know, the party needs conversations on military. They need, the party needs conversation on economy, you know, spending, all of these things, insecurity, all of that. And then he turns to me and says, and you, when it's time to talk about gender, we'll call you. And that is the box I have to struggle to come out of so much. And it happens with so many young women. You know, we have this box that we have to come out of. We work so hard, but we keep getting put in the box, keep getting put in the box. And I think that, you know, the conversation my older aunties are talking about with respect to this, creating these quotas and this system where you have to employ women, you have to set aside seats or offices where, you know, this quota must be filled by women is necessary. And I dare say, you know what? It's not, it's not so much a thing that you say, where are the qualified women? Look around you right now. There are qualified women everywhere. It's not a new phenomenon. And I will step forward to also say that if, we are, if we're looking at oh, where are the qualified people, you know, I don't necessarily think that within the Nigerian system, a lot of men who have gotten into spaces have been qualified. So that conversation always comes up when it's time for disadvantaged groups to get included. And then they start talking about where are the qualified ones. We can't see them. We can't see them. We are everywhere, but we keep getting marginalized. So I think the, the, the biggest step that can be done for women's participation, for men in governance, women in key places, is we have to set aside this quota. And this quota is deserved. This quota is deserving. It's not because we just want to put women there. If you are looking for women who are up to the task, there are women up to the task everywhere, especially in Nigeria. It is about time. Thank you. Yeah, the, just staying with you uh, uh, for one minute, the um, Obidati revolution has been significantly about young people and women. And mm -hmm. is it, the Obidati movement has been driven significantly yes. by young people and by women. Yes. Uh, there is, I mean, when... Um, the candidate Peter Obi met with U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, uh, Fee, in Washington. The group, three women, three men, himself, yeah. myself, one other man, and three of you women. And they actually directly remarked that the last presidential candidate from Nigeria that showed up there came with 17 men. And here we are, <laughs> three men. Three women uh, meeting, <laughs> meeting with them. So clearly, this is a new direction. Yes. If you had to demand something of an Obi Dati government in terms of affirmative action to get women into uh, positions of public authority, what kinds of things would you suggest should be done? I, I would say, I mean, I, I want to be selfish. And left to me, I mean, the other women might be more sensible than I am. But left to me, I would want 75% of women in these spaces and less men. Because you people have had your turn. But I'll, I'll be kind of reasonable. And so let, let's stick within reason. I think that for, for a quota, we can start for, um, with 35% with of permissive action. And that 35% of permissive action is key to, put, to point this. 35% of 
affirmative action does not say, oh, you must put 35% women. No, it says that no gender, because when women are thinking of these things, women tend to think of everyone. We're, we're really the selfless gender here. We tend to think of everyone, and we say, you know what, in no time in the nearest future in Nigeria should any gender have less than 35% representation. And I think that is key. So within, within the, um, um, the, the executive, the request would be that women should not have less. You, you, you don't have to pick it at 35%. Women should not have less than 35% in any office that you're, you're, you're appointing people into. And like I said, like these women who are sitting with you there, you know, uh, Professor Pat, that there are enough women who are who can enter into these positions. So we don't want less than 35%. We want over. We can do 50. We can do 70. We can even do 100. But we do not want to go less than 35%. So that is for that. Now, there is also a bill that has been sitting in the National Assembly, and I know that that bill tends to be controversial, but we have seen how systems like this work um, in, in, in other countries. For example, Kenya. Kenya has the special seats bill, and Nigeria has had that, the 111 special seats that has been sought in the National Assembly, and that keeps getting kicked out. Oh, they say, oh, you want to, uh, how are we going to spend, how are we going to pay these people and all of that. It's not the money that's the problem, it's the representation that is key. And with places like Kenya, we've seen that when you put women, when you give these quotas, people are able to stand, you know, disadvantaged groups are able to stand on these quotas and then project more. So right now, Kenya has six six women governors their regions in 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 in, in kenya there and you can point to you know people like susan kihika and the rest you can point to the growth they have had from the national assembly all the way into becoming governors of these of of of, of this of, of these counties you know these things work you look at the national assembly of kenya right now the number of women who are serving there have greatly increased these quotas are important and i feel that the president himself championing this bill, not leaving it for just women to, you know, women in the National Assembly to keep, to keep suffering alone. The executive has an amount of influence that they can wield, and we're not saying you have to force them, but you have influence. You can't come to the table with legislators and explain to them how important this bill is. This is very important. So the 111 seats bill, and there's a gender and equal opportunities bill that is still sitting. It keeps getting thrown out. We want to see that these things are the forefront of national conversation. I sit on the intersection between women and youth. I'm 33 years old. So far, the youngest uh, presidential campaign spokesperson to ever happen in Nigeria. And I understand what this means and what this position means and what it has also done. That representation helps to bring so many more people to be interested in these spaces. So when we keep saying that we are the women, the women also need to see more women like them. We know the ripple effect of women like Ungozi Okonjo Iwela, women like um, OBS Equestini in leadership positions and what that's been, that has been able to and to do. You look back at that and look at so many more young women entering into political spaces and saying, I want to be like this woman, I want to be like that woman. These things have ripple effects. So we want to see more women, and we don't want them in quiet roles. We want them in key positions. We want them in spaces where they can be seen and heard, because it's only through this that we're going to see that ripple effect coming forward. And I think that is that is the number one thing we want to see from this government. And also, apart from, apart from giving us these positions, we also need to see that this government is, is in tune with making sure that these laws help with the rights of women in Nigeria. Because, you know, the more we keep asking, where are they, where are they? So many things keep Nigerian women from participating. And we need so many more women in these spaces. We do have a sizable number. If you want to appoint, if you want to employ, there's so many women, but we need more. We need more. And what one of the major things standing between Ni Nigerian women is our laws. One of the major things standing between Nigerian women is our customs, our culture, and the religious things that we rely on to stop women from, from, from growing in their, in, the, in their various spaces. And we need to look into this. So it would be really great that when the executive comes, when the Peter Obi government comes in, that the government itself champions this and does not leave it for the few women legislators. And when we say few, I mean few. We have less than 5%. We have 4 point something percent uh, representation of women in the National Assembly. So when women even bring these bills, it doesn't stand a chance. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, I... I'm one of those who actually uh, believe in affirmative action. I think the impact of Thomas Kingsley's 1948 book, Representative Bureaucracy, uh, influence on me for more than 30, 40 years, uh, is a recognition that um, affirmative action can work for the good of all, but that we keep abusing how we implement such programs uh, sometimes around the world. Now, if we had to use affirmative action to insist that women, clearly Beijing came up with the 
target of 35 or 33, well, I remember 35 percent uh, that was suggested. Uh, I would personally, I mean, if I had to form a cabinet, I would be very pleased with a 50-50 uh, 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 share in a cabinet. However, I do recognize that women have far less experience because they've not been given more exposure. So perhaps aggressively, I would go for a 40 percent at least. Uh, to start with, but as things move up, it should, it should ratchet up. There's no reason why we cannot have 50-50 uh, uh, cabinets and, uh, and uh, assembly members and so on and so forth. If a new government wants to change things dramatically in mm -hmm. that regard, what kind of support initiatives besides just uh, 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 law or order that it should be 40, 60 or whatever ratio. What are the support things that the government could be doing to make uh, those who come in feel comfortable in those positions, feel empowered, feel uh, that this is what they should be doing and instead of, oh, we're just a privileged bunch who are pushed into positions. What kind of support systems should government putting in place who oh, are perhaps we can start with you yeah i mean i'd like to address the issue of um, the affirmative action probably in a contrarian manner um, in the area of politics and governance i think it has to be progressive i i don't believe it ought to be by fiat i think that there are enough good women out there who can be identified and showcased uh, during elections um, but more importantly, it's when the appointments are being made. Mm. I think, you know, the last speaker talked about Ungozi Okonjo Iwala. Love her or hate her. Her trajectory so far has shown that she's one of the super women, you know, globally, frankly. You know, uh, when she, you know, assumed the head of the WTO, you could see the celebration all over the world, not just from Africa, which is an acknowledgement of her worth as an individual before she's a woman. And I do think that if a government, politics aside, just in terms of appointments, looks at key positions and picks the very best women that are available mm -hmm. and puts them in those positions, the narrative around politics will change. It's a psychological barrier. It's like the, sp uh, the, the, the speed barrier, the sound barrier, or, you know, whatever. Once you break through it, once you show that there's a critical mass of women, forget whatever hormones you think, you know, is sailing around in their bodies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're able to deliver the goods. Suddenly, there'll be more respect, you know, for, 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 for women as, as appointees and ultimately into elected offices. Let me talk about the private sector. I, I, I am wary of um, interventions, again, in a market space. Mm. I, I do believe that that's an area that ought to be left to progress in, in line with its own self-interests. Mm. Because once you are driven by you know, market economic you know, ideologies, you will make the decisions that are best for you. But when organizations begin to see that women's voices, and let me talk about the, the marketplace. When you look at entry level, I don't think you see that much disparity in percentages between male and female. Mm. When you look at the middle level, I dare say that, you know, at least in the places I have worked in, I, it hasn't uh, been, uh, you know, it has been on the average about the same. You know, it could be 45 percent, 55, one way or the other. But on the average, mm. the problem really is at the top. Glass ceiling. The, the glass ceiling. And, and that's what we need to work on, 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 you know, dealing with and breaking. But I think increasingly organizations are beginning to see that when you have a qualified woman, there are innate qualities she brings to the conversation that men cannot even fathom. And in a society that's increasingly becoming inclusive, where, you know, things have been democratized, suddenly the inclusive voice of the female is a voice that society tends to respond to, not the kind of command control, you know, attitude, the alpha male type of syndrome, which you expect to see in a lot of these organizations. So even for business, just for the survival, the success, the differentiation of a business, there is a strong case to be made for having women have a very, very strong voice at the top.
Um, and let me make the final statement, and this is a really a plea. I see a lot of men, just prof, like you said, when you said, you know, my daughter, why won't I expect her to, you know. It, it's funny how men who have daughters in the, in the workplace see other women and are not as accommodating as you would expect when it comes to those top, you know, positions. Innately, there's something about the boys club which I think is, is a preferred default for a lot of men. So when you look around yourself, what you want to see is people who look like you and probably talk like you. But you will encourage your daughter, obviously. But how about encouraging the other women um, and, and, and understanding that this is a challenge we've all got to take up and, and address? Yeah. No, that's a, a very valid point to make. But if you look at an organization that is servicing a whole customer, group. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who pay the money to buy things are women. You would expect that in its own interest, you would want the people making those decisions to think like the consumers that they're selling to. So there's a, a rational reason to actually expect women to rise uh, uh, faster in the kinds of organizations that are selling to uh, a population that is significantly female. Yeah. Um, however, you find uh, sometimes that there is this old boys club thing that, that needs to be broken yeah. either by formal governance in organizations uh, and, 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 and many times actually we are the, the nature of our culture has made the best qualified people women for a long time I used to make the point that the best bankers in Nigeria were female for a very simple reason that in the early days of banking growth the, the young men who got into banking were rushing to take opportunities as the banking industry was expanding. So a young man enters as a, an officer today, seven years later he has reached GM, mm -hmm. he's gone through five banks, but he doesn't know anything about banking. Uh, and, and I used to say publicly that it, my favorite treasurer in banking was Funke Oshibodu, mm -hmm. because she didn't feel those pressures that those men felt to go up and down. She stayed at Citibank and simply learned banking. Uh, uh, and so, I would think that it should not be a surprise that many people who are emerging as CEOs in banking today would be female. Uh, uh, so I, I think that governance needs to play a more important role for private sector uh, in that regard. However, in the public sector, again, because populations matter, and that's the whole concept of representative bureaucracy, that those who make decisions should reflect those that are making decisions for. Uh, a lot more women ought uh, to be considered in terms of the value of public choice, you know. So uh, uh, what, what, what do you think we should be doing to provide support just in case there are not even enough, let's say, ready women for certain kinds of positions? What kind of support can be Number one, given? it's just impossible that there would not be enough ready women. Mm -hmm. You know, women's rights are human rights, full stop. We all start in the same schools. Mm -hmm. We beat the boys in class. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about your sex at that time until suddenly you get to secondary school and you become a woman and you suddenly become a lesser person as a result. Mm -hmm. So that, there are already women. Mm -hmm. There are enough of us to fill those positions. If I were president of Nigeria today, right? First things first, I have executive powers. I appoint my ministers, don't I? Yeah. It will be 50-50. That's a decision I make. Yes, it has to be from 36 states and the FCT. Fine. There's sufficient capable men and women from all of those states. Mm. So, number one. Number two, government policy. Again, you don't need a uh, law per se. Mm. Local content started with a policy before eventually evolved into a law. Mm. So, I can give preference to companies that put diversity mm -hmm. at the forefront and have equal and fair representation in accordance with our constitution. Mm -hmm. And those companies would get priority in procurement and other things. Mm -hmm. That will lead the market mm -hmm. in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It's happening in other countries. Mm -hmm. Why can't it happen here? Yeah. Rwanda had a policy of 50-50 and they filled the, the Yes. Beijing, 35% was just the start. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be where we stop. Mm -hmm. 
And if we haven't started in all these years, then we should not be talking 35%. You, you know, I, I do agree with you, actually. Uh, the Part of the problem I have seen watching the scene for years is that many organizations do not affirmatively deal with the things that slow women down. I'll give you a simple example, childbirth. Mm -hmm. Many women have to take time off work to go and raise the family at the point. Even in the UK, one of the biggest challenges I have in the UK is that female doctors, by the time they go out and have their two children and raise them to a level and come back to work, they literally have to be retrained as doctors. So the average female doctor costs the system a lot more than the average male doctor. But people have been made to compensate for that because um, there are organizations that have policies that when you take that time out to speak, to go and raise the children, there are things that are affirmative that goes on that helps with your continuous retraining while you're away from the workplace so that when you're ready to come back, you don't really lose seniority and, and stuff like that. In my profession, so I had the privilege of practicing law in England and here, we found exactly what you said. Women are entering at the same level mm. and then six, seven years down the line, they go off to have children, mm. they return and they find that they've been left behind. Mm -hmm. They find that the way of working is no longer uh, compatible with this new lifestyle of looking after a little child. Mm. And they drop out. The organizations are throwing their hands up in the air and wondering why they're dropping out and not understanding that they have to support. So what sort of support did we ask for and mm. campaign for? And that is making a big change now. It's flexible working. We're professionals, mm -hmm. right? We can be trusted to work and deliver not nine to five, which is the old industrial age style of working, mm -hmm. but working with technology. Therefore, I can start work at 7 a.m., do all my drafting, take my child off to school, return, see clients, go back do the school run, give that child something to eat, start again at 4 p.m. or 6 p.m. and still do a full day's work. Once that became recognized by the law firms, that mm -hmm. flexible working is not part-time working, retention went through the roof. That's a real-life example yeah. of what organizations can sure. do sure. to support and, and, this is why I and it. retain women. So, so that um, the system, both the public and private system, can recognize these things and create the atmosphere that will facilitate the talents that is in our women continuing to contribute to the growth and development of our country. Fortunately, time is out and we've got to go. So, um, but the points that you've made are very, very important and hopefully will guide policy. And I hope that uh, Peter Obi and I, that people of our med are listening very, very carefully and that they will do the things that will make a difference. Thank you all. Thank you.